Module 9 Relational Summary Lecture, GWE1. From the founding of our nation until quite recently, climate change was going on, deliberately. Far from being seen as a bad thing, climate change was openly discussed as a desirable way to conquer the West, to terraform America, and make it more suitable for European colonists. Even Benjamin Franklin, who was an astute meteorologist, and Thomas Jefferson, the gentleman farmer, talked and wrote about the desire of the early settlers to clear the forests, drain the swamps, and plow the land, specifically to make what they thought would be a more salubrious climate, more like England's green and pleasant land. The one sung about in William Blake's Jerusalem, considered England's most popular patriotic song and second national anthem. You know the lyrics, don't you? And did those feet, in ancient time, walk upon England's mountains green? And was the Holy Lamb of God on England's pleasant pastures seen? And did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills? And was Jerusalem builded here among those dark satanic mills? Bring me my bow of burning gold, bring me my arrows of desire, bring me my spear, O oh, clouds unfold, bring me my chariot of fire. I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand, till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. These lyrics were written between 1804 and 1808, and the sentiment was something all English speakers were abuzz about, even as they witnessed the dark satanic mills created by the early Industrial Revolution, its deforestation and early turn to coal. At that time, America was officially just 32 years old, around the age of Jesus when he walked, and the mythology of a wild west to conquer suggested a fresh start was available for those who felt that the Jerusalem project in England might be failing. If only they could get the climate of the American continent to cooperate. If only they could get rid of those pesky dark damp forests and swamps and those pesky natives who were so well adapted to them. The early settlers and the political class really believed that they could make America their new holy land. They had no understanding of how the warm Gulf Stream waters make England so nice. England, which sits at the same latitude as much of Canada. As an article in BuzzFeed praising a certain warm oceanic current explains it, quote, even the southernmost point of Britain is further north than the northernmost part of the contiguous United States, while London lies further north than almost all major Canadian cities, including Vancouver, Montreal, Quebec City, and Toronto. Without that warm oceanic current, which climate change is disrupting, by the way, England wouldn't be a green and pleasant land at all. But the early English settlers of America, being scientifically compromised or just plain ignorant, thought the problem was forests and wetlands, and believed that by removing them, they could make their New England just like home, and even better. They could make their New England just like home, or even better. They were wrong. But it wasn't for lack of trying. You see, we've always known about climate change. We just thought that whatever changes the conquerors and colonists made were good things, because we had that belief in what the imperialists called manifest destiny. As the History Channel points out, quote, many of these late 19th and early 20th century settlers lived by the superstition that rain follows the plow. Emigrants, land speculators, politicians, and even some scientists believed that homesteading and agriculture would permanently affect the climate of the semi-arid Great Plains region, making it more conducive to farming, end quote. So imagine that. It turns out we've been talking about climate change and doing climate change since the founding of our country. But we've been doing it with almost no understanding of the ecology of the Western Hemisphere. As a result, all of those deep climate regulating and healthy microbiome diverse soils that made America the breadbasket and sugar and tobacco and cotton and beef king of the world for so long were completely depleted, leading to the tragic dust bowl of the dirty 30s that in turn led to the replacement of true soil with mere dirt laden with fossil fuel derived NPK fertilizers and pesticides reliant on fossil consuming tractors and farm machinery. After destroying the carbon holding, life supporting native environments, the people who came from the East tried to put the ecology of the West on life support, but ultimately just prolonged the suffering of a dying patient whose carbon and methane and nitrogen gasps 
contribute over 10.5% of global warming emissions. Agriculture and forestry today provide little of the rapid carbon cycling and none of the sequestration that American soils and forests and coastal littoral zones had contributed to the previous cornucopian balance that Lewis and Clark had witnessed. And don't even get me started on the obsession with the American lawn, particularly in the arid parts of the West. Ecologically, for the purpose of this course, the West is considered to be that hemisphere west of Greenwich, England meridian, the zero degrees longitude line, wrapping around to the anti-meridian at 180 degrees longitude, which puts us in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. The prime meridian famously passes through Greenwich, England, hence the concept of Greenwich Mean Time, as well as France and Spain and Europe and Algeria, Mali, Burkina Faso, Tongo and Ghana and Africa before finally crossing Antarctica. The anti-meridian mostly passes through the open waters of the Pacific Ocean, but passes across land in Russia, Fiji, and Antarctica. This means that from a technical standpoint, the land masses of ecological interest comprise only the westernmost chunks of Ireland, England, France, and Spain, and a few countries on the west coast of Africa, all of Greenland and Iceland, and of course, all of North and South America and the Caribbean. That is the ecological west that we are dealing with in these modules. So because we've organized this course along the literal lines of spatial geography, we don't want to confuse you with what has been called Western civilization, most of which is located east of the prime meridian, and given its shared cultural characteristics, it really is more of a northern hemisphere phenomenon. In fact, as we mentioned in the lectures on the north, both ecology and culture really seem to owe more to latitudinal similarities and differences than longitudinal, except where that wonderful warm ocean gulf stream has naturally changed the climate to make it more pleasant for Europeans. Remember that with regards to climate, quote, for every 100 meter rise in altitude, the temperature decreases by about one degree Celsius, end quote. And according to the NIH, quote, outside the tropics, average annual temperature declines on average 0.7 degrees Celsius for each degree of latitude in the northern hemisphere and on average 0.5 degrees Celsius for each degree of latitude in the southern hemisphere, end quote. The technical reason for this is because the sun hits the earth at an angle and thus when it hits northern or southern hemispheres, it has to pass through more air before hitting the ground and therefore disperses much of its heat over a wider area. Whereas over the tropics, where the sun's rays are perpendicular to the ground, they pass through much less air. Remember, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And in the tropics, the sun is more or less straight overhead. Rotate the Earth along the meridians of longitude, and of course it does absolutely nothing to affect those, the length of those rays. For this reason, the ecologies of the Western Hemisphere and the Eastern Hemisphere, even though separated by massive oceans, are remarkably similar. So similar, in fact, that even when organisms in those environments come from completely different ancestral stock, they have experienced what we call convergent evolution. Take as a great example the cactus family of the West, native to Central America, and then the spiny members of the Euphorbia family of Africa and India in the East. Many people can't tell them apart, but they are completely unrelated. It's simply that they adapted to similar climatological conditions on different sides of the Earth. The same is true of North American and Northern European otters and bison and bears and deer. Look at the convergence between lions in East Africa and mountain lions in Western Colorado. Witness the similarities between the Circopithecidae, the Old World monkeys, and the New World monkeys, Calatricidae, Cibidae, Iotidae, Pithecidae, and Atelidae. And most extreme of all, look at the marsupials of Australia and the mammals of South America, two lands down under, with completely different origins, converging on adaptive ecological strategies. Now, of course, because North and South have so much more significance than East and West, when it comes to ecology and even the way that ecology shape cultures, it would be hard to say much about the ecological differences between East and West, but for one curious reality. In the Western Hemisphere, our current moment in plate tectonic time has a huge land mass spanning North and South, the Americas. While in the East Hemisphere, we have the same, Eurasia and Africa. And so what we see is that the most salient ecological characteristics of these land masses is actually the amount of forest. 
Forests span the globe, leading science fiction author Ursula K. Le Guin to write a parable of ecological destruction and climate change called The Word for World is Forest. And then what becomes most interesting is that with the appearance of civilization in what we call the Middle East, the most notable ecological change is the disappearance of forests. Not just that. We note their disappearance to the axe and plow and fire, and then their replacement by desert. I didn't really get it until I got into Harvard in 1980 and took a freshman class in evolutionary biology with the legendary E.O. Wilson. He was actively trying to protect the last remaining rainforests of the Amazon, the Congo, and Indonesia at that time, and showed us evidence that the lion's share of the blame for the distribution of deserts today belonged not to natural climate changes, but to civilization. He told the class, quote, at the time of the Roman Empire, when Antony was courting Cleopatra, you could walk from Carthage in Tunisia to Alexandria in Egypt under the shade of trees. Today we think of the deserts of Africa and the Middle East as simply the normal habitat of those regions, but nothing could be further from the truth. My grandfather came to visit me from Baghdad, Iraq that summer and started teaching me Arabic, and I asked him about this. He said, oh, I've witnessed it in my own lifetime, and it just gets worse. You know, when I was a boy in the 1920s and even into the 1930s when your mother was born, we still had African lions living in our country in the north, near Mosul. We would see them in the mountains. And of course, that would be the case, because Iraq is really part of the Rift Valley from East Africa that carves its way up through the Red Sea to the Levant along those lines of longitude. The whole region was a migratory pathway north and south for birds and animals, and following the animals is how humanity left Africa to populate the rest of the world in the first place. Sophomore year of college, the great paleoarchaeologist Glyn Isaacs told us in class that his research was confirming what many of us were beginning to suspect. Civilizations, he said, don't usually collapse because of politics or social strife or warfare. They collapse because they destroy the ecology that supports them. Environmental collapse then fuels the social and political problems that led to civilizations collapse. The rise and fall of civilizations is really the story of environmental degradation. And the vast areas of desert we see in the world are testimony to the destructiveness of our species. Much of this is now documented in my former UCLA professor Jared Diamond's prize-winning history book, Collapse, How Societies Choose to Fail or Succeed, from 2004. For the first time, we began to understand why archaeologists usually found the ancient cities of the Middle East and Southeast European region by digging in desert sands and dry areas. Another anthropology professor told us, of course, there were civilizations all over the world, and with the exception of the Maya temples of Central America and the temples of Angkor Wat in Southeast Asia, we don't readily see the evidence of the ones that rose and fell in the forested areas of the world, because people tended to build out of wood, which decays over time. By the time European archaeologists found them, following their imperialist soldiers who had wiped out the peoples who built them, the great wooden city-states like Timbuktu and Benin had rotted into soil. And this encouraged the racists who rewrote history to justify slavery by claiming that there had been no great civilization south of the Sahara in Africa. But that's nonsense. One thing we can say about forest cities, though, is that while sufficient ecological damage was done to eventually cause their collapse, the people didn't disappear or move away as they did in the desertified areas. They just adopted a simpler lifestyle. This message was brought home to me by my friend Pedro Cook, a Maya Quiche development specialist who I was helping to build an ecological research center in the lakeside village of Macanche near the ruins of Tikal. We were reviving the use of the sacred Maya breadnut tree, the tree that had sustained his people for thousands of years by planting a 10,000 seedling nursery by the lake near the solar-powered, compost-toilet-outfitted, rain-water-capture-equipped research lodge that our Taiwanese philanthropist friend, Martha Liu, had funded. Pedro took Martha and me and a fellow African-American graduate student to a patch of barren ground on the other side of the lake and did a sacred planting fire blessing ritual. First, he reached into the barren ground and pulled up a fistful of dry sand and hard pan laterite clay. He said sadly, this is what our land turns into when people abuse the soil by cutting down the trees and planting annual crops and grains. It turns to desert 
where nothing can grow anymore. He then led us over to another patch of ground that glistened with moist blackness and knelt down, scooping the precious earth into his hands and passing it under our noses to smell. And this is what I'm turning it into by putting the organic material back in, compost and food waste from the city and animal manures, e even my own, and planting trees and shrubs and encouraging wildlife. This soil is life. And then he built a fire and started the ceremony. He said, my people, the Quiche, come from the highlands of Guatemala, and our capital city was called Iximche. Do you know what Iximche means? It means the tree of life, and it is the name of the Maya breadnut tree that we are planting here. The same tree whose forest surrounds Tikal and all the great ruins of our once proud civilization. You see, at one time we lived primarily off of tree cereals, making our bread from a nut from a tree that is high in protein. But then it seems we got addicted to corn, to a grain that is very sweet and that we used in ceremonies. And little by little we started clearing the forest to plant more and more corn and created a mythology about the corn gods wanting sacrifices from us. Once we transformed the landscape from bread nut to cornbread, from tree tortillas to grain tortillas, the rains went away and the land dried up. We changed our climate by cutting our trees and our civilization started to collapse. So by the time the conquistadors came, we couldn't fight back. We didn't go away. We Maya people didn't disappear. We simply went back into the forest as it regrew and led simpler lives. But it was a powerful lesson, a lesson my parents learned from their parents. Soil is life. And then he said, now I know that Martha understands because her people also created ancient civilizations in the East and learned the same lesson. And so she is trying to help us make things better here in the West. And Charles here, his people created ancient civilizations in Africa and built what we now call the United States. He's almost a native son here because his people have been in America for 500 years. But this guy, and he pointed to me, we love TH, but his family on his father's side came from, from the potato famine in Ireland a mere 150 years ago or so, after Europe had destroyed their land, and his mother from a place that civilization turned into desert. And these people continue to think the answer to prosperity involves extracting more and more. Well, of course, I don't believe that, but my people. The scourge that Europe brought to the West was a deeply seated cultural belief in the value of extractive economies. Plowing and pulling value from the earth was passed down from generation to generation, and it worked because as long as there was a further West to expand into, one never really had to look back upon the damage we'd done. The westward expansion was, and unfortunately still is, merely subsidized by fossil fuel inputs, all about a locust-like strategy of settlement, extraction, destruction, and moving on. What we did wasn't farming, according to my graduate professor Susanna B. Hecht, author of Fate of the Forest. What we've done is actually mining. We've mined the earth and robbed her of nutrients. And the economic engine wasn't even what we got out of the ground. The money came from speculation. The true driver of westward hope turns out to have been the profit that can be derived from land speculation, the old buy low, sell high. Schemers and get-rich-quick dreamers would flip land the way we now flip houses, buy it cheap when it's covered in forest or prairie or wetland, conveniently called wilderness. Say you're going to improve the land, but then viciously degrade it through extracting timber and water and minerals, mine the rich soils left behind for their nitrogen, phosphorus, and above all carbon, and keep that up for a number of harvests, sell it to the highest bidder at the peak of productivity, and then quickly get out of Dodge and let them deal with the collapse in value as it turns to dust. When we finally hit the West Coast with this strategy and there wasn't anywhere else to go, the extractive strategy created deserts and dust bowls. To bring them back into production, we then mined fossil solids, liquids, and gases from other faraway regions, coal, oil, and gas, and dump them on the ruined dirt to breathe a little more life into it. The dirt, of course, contained none of the rich biodiversity that acts as checks and balances in a healthy ecosystem, and so more fossil fuel-derived pesticides and herbicides had to be added to maintain some productivity until the soil was not only exhausted, but toxic as well. As Professor Hecht declared in class one day, we don't have farms anymore. They're merely open-air factories. That is the consequence of an extractive economy that depends on mining the earth. 
But there is one form of extraction from the Earth, along the meridians, along the lines of longitude, that is almost universally good. In our drawdown textbook showing the 100 best solutions and their impact by 2050, it is ranked solution number 18, reducing 16.6 .6 gigatons of CO2 at a net cost of $155.5 billion with a net savings of $1.02 trillion. And that drawdown solution is the extraction of heat from the Earth, something we have far too much of right now, and it's called geothermal power. And between improved technologies for getting energy from the delta T of temperature differential between hot and cold areas, and improved turbines, it is turning out that we can use various types of geothermal gradients down in the earth and right at the surface for a wide variety of things, including highly efficient HVAC systems, to say nothing of electricity generation. There are updated figures for alternate modeling scenarios on the Drawdown website. Now, as a graduate student, I traveled to Iceland to see this climate-friendly miracle in action and regaled with other urban planners in the geothermal electricity plants wastewater, sitting with a waterproof copy of McDonough's Cradle to Cradle in the Blue Lagoon Spa at 3 a.m. in the perpetual twilight, asking them, asking them why this solution wasn't used everywhere. Later that year, I went up the west coast of the United States to Geyser, California, to videotape Old Faithful spout up its perpetual fountain of clean energy and then to one of our own domestic geothermal power plants. I made an informational video of it that you can see in our resources section. And that is where I learned that the entire west coast of the U.S., to say nothing of the Rift Valley up and down through Africa southward, and the Middle East and Italy northward, and the entire archipelago of Indonesia and Malaysia, on up through Japan, to say nothing of Hawaii, are hotbeds of geothermal heat that can be used to generate carbon-neutral electricity with none of the risks of the nuclear power plants like Fukushima that have made such a mess. Everywhere where the plates that make up continents meet, they create what is called the Ring of Fire. A Ring of Fire. And it spans the globe. You can see it active wherever you find volcanoes, but everywhere else it manifests as hot springs that can be harnessed for clean steam to drive turbines. Unless you think you must drill deeply to get it or find places with extreme temperatures to make it useful, in 2010, National Geographic sent me up to a resort called China Hot Springs, north of Fairbanks, Alaska, where the owner, charismatic Bernie Carl, showed me his Rankin Cycle gas turbine that uses low-grade thermal energy, the mere temperature of the hot spring spa itself, to create electricity. It doesn't need high-pressure steam because it uses organic solvents that have a lower heat of vaporization. When we were lounging in his hot spring spa, I asked Bernie about other hot springs, like the famous Ein Suchna resort in Cairo, Egypt, that has been a hot spot for tourists since the time of the pharaohs. I had read a report by the World Bank from the 1960s, while Egypt was using Russian money to build the ecologically disruptive Aswan High Dam up the Nile for hydropower, and the paper was evaluating the potential for Egypt to meet its growing power needs with geothermal power, since it sits on a tectonic plate. The report concluded sadly that the steam needed was found too deep for the venture to be economical, and the hot springs nearer the surface weren't hot enough. Bernie said, my operation is living proof that it can work, absolutely. But despite all the visitors we have here and all the talks I give, this simple technology is really hard to get adopted. And I mean, we've refined it, but the concept of organic cycle engines isn't exactly new. No. In fact, as Science Daily reported some years ago, quote, organic Rankine cycle or ORC development started in the 1850s and followed the development of steam engines. Only a small pure play companies, only a few small pure play companies were perseverant enough, however, to turn the ORC niche into a commercial success, end quote. Uh, that's the 1850s. Seeing me realize, uh, seeing this, made me realize that when I was a grad student living at the LA Echo Village near downtown LA, we could have been using low-grade geothermal power to provide electricity and hot water to our entire apartment complex, hell, to a substantial part of the city, since the 1850s, when Los Angeles County was established after California was ceded to the U.S. when the Mexican-American War ended in 1848. Our urban Echo Village apartment in the early 1900s was actually the hotel for the Bimini Bith but for the Bimini Bathhouse, where Charlie Chaplin and Douglas Fairbanks and other movie stars and politicians used to bathe and stay. 
It sits above the geothermal hot springs that once created the famous Bimini Baths, which was the terminal destination for the once famous red car electric trolley featured in the Disney movie Who Framed Roger Rabbit. But like the red car, those baths were closed down in the 1950s when the racist white owners were no longer able to legally keep blacks out at the beginning of the civil rights movement. To keep the area underdeveloped, as white flight began from the city to the suburbs, the hot springs were completely plugged with cement. Still, the technology is here, and it's well developed today, and the geothermal hot water to make clean electricity, and of course domestic and commercial hot water, will always be there, and everywhere else where the perpetual magma of the Earth's mantle comes close to the surface. And even where it isn't close, it isn't any harder to get than oil. You don't believe me? Petro Online tells us, quote, Back when records began, oil wells were an average of 3,635 feet deep, but that was 65 years ago. And since 1949, we've used up these shallow reserves. Oil is a finite resource, meaning we now have to dig deeper to find it, with the 2008 average depth coming in at an average of 5,964 feet. That's like a mile. They go on to say, quote, we've covered the average depth of oil wells, but what about the deepest examples? Here's where the topic gets really interesting and almost incomprehensible, they say. First, imagine the depth of the Grand Canyon. The average Texas oil well is 900 feet deeper again, but this is quite literally just scratching the surface. Hydraulic fracturing reaches depths ranging from 5,000 feet to 20,000 feet. Now consider the average depth of the ocean, 12,430 feet, and you're beginning to get an idea of the scale. But this is far from the deepest method of oil extraction. Deepwater Horizon, they say, the well responsible for the 2010 BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, sits at 35,500 feet, five feet beneath the surface. And the world's deepest oil well, Sakhalin 1 in Russia, reaches an incredible 40,604 feet. That's 7.7 .7 miles, or 15 times the height of the world's tallest building, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. That's how deep we're going to get oil. Meanwhile, Wikipedia cites articles stating that, quote, estimates of the potential for electricity generation from geothermal energy vary sixfold from 0.035 to 2 terawatts, depending on the scale of investments. Upper estimates of geothermal resources assume enhanced geothermal wells as deep as 10 kilometers, whereas existing geothermal wells are rarely more than 3 kilometers or 2 miles deep. Wells of this depth are now common in the petroleum industry. The big difference is, with geothermal wells, you never have to worry about those disastrous oil spills and those environmental and social costs. So you gotta ask, why aren't we drilling for the thereafter free, clean, safe nuclear heat beneath our feet when it is actually less difficult and far more sustainable than drilling for oil and certainly building artificial nuclear power plants here at the surface? Especially when the Rankine cycle engine lets you exploit hot water at the surface. The answer, of course, is merely politics, and that is sad. In fact, it's criminal, since so many lives have been lost. So let me finish with a little song I wrote with my students to cheer you up. It parodies Alaskan vice presidential candidate Sarah Palin's statement by agreeing that we should drill, but for climate stabilizing hot water instead of climate disrupting and toxic fossil fuels. Drill, baby, drill for geothermal. Drill, baby, drill, we can tap the steam But 
bridge that we drill from oil and it makes me scream. There's a nuclear reactor 4,000 miles down in the center of the earth on a planet that's round. So everyone can have it and it's safe, sound and clean. But nukes up at the surface, come on, that's obscene. When we can drill, baby, drill for geothermal. Drill, baby, drill, Earth's an inferno. Drill, baby, drill, no need to burn, no. Drill, baby, drill, we don't want your oil or coal.